as you know, I tend to throw a curveball from time to time, and I, I like to keep you on your toes, right? I don't like it to be the the normal stuff as far as you kind of know what shipwrecks are important. Uh, I like to throw in different things. So we're going to go through that here in a minute. Uh, Dan says the Sultana. Great choice. That's a good choice. But I'll say this. Didn't make my list. I don't know. My M.A. Joe's list will never know unless he pops back in here. Uh, Shorzy, what is going on, my friend? Kojak. You got, Kojak is gone with the Indy. That one almost made my list. That tells you something. Almost made my list. So let's rock and roll here. We'll just act like it's the old times when it was just me and you in the chat hanging out. And uh, like I said, if Joe pops back in here, we'll bring Joe up. So number three, we're going to start at the bottom of the list like I do. Um, we go from the third choice all the way up to my number one choice. Uh, remember last week we did films set in the 1700s. Uh, this week, obviously, we are doing chips. And for my number three pick, I chose the Vasa. Now, you're going to be like, I have no idea what the Vasa is. I'm glad some of you don't know what the Vasa is. But the Vasa is my number three pick. And it was built between 1626 and 1628 in Sweden. It was built for King Gustavus Adolphus of Sweden. He is at war with Poland and Lithuania at this time. And he wants to up his military might. And he wants to build this grand ship that is kind of like showcasing the power of the Swedes. It's constructed in Stockholm. It's a huge vessel, 226 feet long, 172 feet high, and has a 38-foot beam. This thing is massive. It has 48 24-pound artillery on board, eight three-pounders, six howitzers, and two one-pounder guns. This thing is huge. Not only that, it's immaculately decorated on the outside. And if you are, have a second monitor available to you right now or you want to open a different tab, Google the VASA or VASA, however you want to say it. Uh, it is an amazing ship. She weighs 1,210 tons. Uh, she could carry 145 sailors and approximately 300 troops. Joe is just popping on. I'll bring him up in a second. And the king's men were hesitant about this ship for obvious reasons. Welcome in, Joe. Joe is back. We'll see how Joe Ricci, everybody from Franklin, Tennessee, in the house. Joe, I just started in just to get keep us on time. Yeah. Um, and cool. uh, and 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 uh, thank you for your hard work at fighting with your PC <laughs> to be here. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I already chose my third choice, uh, so I jumped ahead, Joe, and uh, I picked the Vasa. Uh, so everything is going fine for the King of Sweden. 1626 to 1628, this thing is under construction. It's a pretty huge vessel, immaculately uh, armed, ready to go. And on 10 August 1628, this thing sets sail. It's about 300 feet off of the coastline, and there's a large population of people to see this ship off, kind of like when we would see ships leaving dock for the first time, people waving handkerchiefs and, and sending it off. This is happening at the same time in the 1600s. Uh, her gun ports are open. That way people can see all these bronze guns on board. Again, it's got 48 24-pounders on board. This thing is huge. Okay. As she passes some bluffs, a strong wind caught her sails. And when it did, it nearly tipped her onto her port side, on her left side. It nearly tipped her over. And they immediately started taking sails down, trying to get it righted. And they do a good job. They actually save the ship from being rolled. And they keep on going. They go to the next bluff, and the wind hits again. And when it does... Tilts it to port, tilts it so far to port, the water goes into the gun ports. 
So water is rushing into the ship and it is sinking the ship and sinking this vessel. So this time, because the gun ports are open, it dooms the entire ship. In minutes, it's sunk in a hundred feet of water. And in that crowd is the king himself. So he gets to see this ship sink in front of him. Uh, Vasa is raised in 1961 from the depths. And in 1988, housed until 1988, housed in temporary storage. So technically it's a shipwreck, but, you know, it's, it's not in the water anymore. In 1990, the Vasa Museum was officially opened and you can visit the ship to this day. And as I said, if you Google the Vasa, you'll see some pictures of this thing. And it is just a beautiful, beautiful structure. But yeah, it didn't really work out for the king of Sweden. And uh, he and his people got to watch this thing sink right in front of their eyes. So yeah. <laughs> So yes, that's that's my number three choice. Yes, roll rolled over in light winds. That's right, Kojak. Yeah. So that is my number three pick. Joe. I guess as long as the computer is up, I can uh yeah. I can try. And I'm working, I'm doing both right now. I'm trying to get my laptop up. I'm using my wife's right now. Ah. Well, we're going to see how this works. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yes. Uh, so my number three pick, like I told you, um, I went to Obscure. I decided to mm -hmm. do something a little bit, you know, a little bit uh, out there. I went with the uh, sinking of the U.S. Coast Guard cutter Alexander Hamilton. Oh. Yeah. So we're looking... Mm, 42, late January 1942. So right there, kind of at the cusp of the the second happy time. Mm -hmm. And I also thought about, like last week when you did the top three movie picks, we couldn't make it a whole way through without mentioning Alexander Hamilton. And I figured this just needs to be the tradition there for all of them. You have Every to bring week. out Alexander Hamilton in Every some week. way. Yeah. Um, so here's her deal. She is uh, moving in response to a distress call. And at 1 p.m. on January 29th, 1942, a U-boat, U-132, fired two torpedoes. And it actually, they were aiming for the Yukon, the ship that the Hamilton was moving to help. They missed and they struck the Hamilton and they hit the boiler room. Uh, instantly, the crew that's in the boiler room is killed. Temperatures inside the ship went from livable to 500 degrees. All of the steam carrying pipes failed. Um, oh. Boiler room, like I said, that crew is killed instantly. Um, comms are blown off of the side of the ship. It's got kind of the, the lattice work, the, the, the ladder structure of the communications tower up the side. It's blown off of the, the side of the cutter. So they can't communicate with anybody. And the only thing that they can do is fire off two of their uh, uh, three-inch guns as a distress call, fire off those two rounds, try to get somebody's attention. Um, it gets even worse, though. As the crew's attempting to abandon ship, 26 of the lifeboats that are on board are damaged by the torpedo blast, too. Oh, Hamilton well, is hanging on. Uh, she's listing really, really hard, listing really, really, really hard. And then finally, at 8 o'clock on the 30th, so she makes it all the way through the night into the next afternoon, uh, finally sinks. Um, and eventually, the crew who's left is pulled off by the USS Erickson. But it's one of those oh, kind of late, late tragedies uh, as you get into 42. And, and the Hamilton was uh, essentially... It, a bystander that just happened to move in the right, the wrong spot at the wrong time. Wow. So there's my number three. Pick. That, yeah, that boiler room hit. Oh, that's something we don't usually think about. We think about it hitting like a magazine. Yeah. But a boiler yeah. room hit is just as bad. It's worse. I mean, that's, that's like an anti personnel thing. I mean, because those pipes run through every single room through all the carrying areas of the ship. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. That's 
That is not good. That is not good. All right, everybody. We got round one done. I just placed a poll in to the chat. Let us know who you think has the best pick for the first round. Um, I don't know why it's acting up on me, but it is. It's just the way this thing is. Uh, <laughs> vote early, vote often, everybody. Uh, again, my pick is the VASA. Uh, Joe's is the U.S. Coast Guard cutter, Alexander Hamilton. Uh, we are at 50-50 in the poll. We have nine people watching. So I want to see nine votes. This is American democracy at work. <laughs> Let's go. You know, I, I want to see this. Um, but yeah, this is this is a good start because these are two that people would not have thought about. You know? Oh yeah, my whole list is two that I don't think I. If I wasn't looking for something super obscure, I wouldn't have found this. My my next one people will know about, but my final one I think is my next curveball. So and it's my number one. So <clears throat> six votes. We're almost through. Thank you all for voting. Welcome. Welcome in, everybody. Again, if you're not already subscribed, please slap that subscribe button because from now on, all of my live streams will take place on this platform. So I would love to see you here. How are other things in Franklin, my friend, while we're waiting on these votes to come in? I'll be honest with you. I was going to have a good voter here watching. Catherine had her computer in the other room. She was going to watch. And now you're, you're rigging in the vote. Yeah. <laughs> Look, it's a true American democracy. You're uh, gerrymandering the vote. You said you wanted to be authentic. Um, yeah, no, mm -hmm. things are going great. Uh, I, I can't yeah. can't complain. Good days yeah. out there on the battlefield, you know. Good. And yourself? <clears throat> I'm busy. I'm busy teaching, my friend. Getting this World Civ class. Kicking some awesome. people in the butt. Get get them moving. Awesome. Yeah. Hey, uh, we need one more vote to break this tie. <laughs> we got six votes. I it almost is, had it. It is three, three right now. We need to break this tie. <clears throat> so please, uh, one more person at least vote. We got 10 people watching right now. Vote for who takes round one. Again, Joe's pick is the U.S. Coast Guard cutter Alexander Hamilton sunk during the Second World War. Mine is the VASA. If you want to go old school, uh, old school Swede. Oh, we're, oh, that was beautiful. We got seven votes, and then we got to eight votes, and it's again 50-50. <laughs> I think we just tie. I think we're just going to need a recount. Do we go to overtime? <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. like sudden death overtime. Should we, should we do a fourth one later? Just pull one out. Just like, eh, yeah. <clears throat> All right, nine votes out of ten. That's a 90% voter rate. I will. That's pretty great. That's pretty good. You get 90% afraid... in a week, you know, I... <laughs> I'm afraid to get an even number because it might go back to 50-50. All right. Nine votes are in. Uh, somehow I took that round. I don't know. 56-44. Poll ending right now. We'll have another one up in each round. Thank you, everybody, for voting. Please continue to uh, consider voting. And uh, <clears throat> I guess I'll have to go first because I went first last round. All right. So let me... Uh, Put this in here. You're going to know this one uh, because it's just, you're going to know. <laughs> My number two pick for shipwrecks, and I would it would help if I put the correct number for the shipwreck as well. There we go. My number two pick is the Edmund Fitzgerald. Oh. Yeah. Number two. Oh. That number was a two. great placement for it. Number two pick. The Edmund Fitzgerald. You got to have that. You got to have that going on. Um, so uh, Edmund Fitzgerald was launched in 1958. She's the largest ship on the Great Lakes. And she remains the largest to ever sink in the Great Lakes uh, to this day. 729 feet in length, 75 feet across. Uh, Edmund Fitzgerald was known for hauling the iron ore from Duluth area in the mines to Detroit, Michigan. She set six seasonal haul records. Uh, she's known as the Fitz, the Mighty Fitz, the Pride of the American Side, the Toledo Express, 
and finally the, the Titanic of the Great Lakes. Uh, one of the captains is Peter Pulser, which we could pick on that name all you want to later. I don't want to get kicked off YouTube. Uh, played music. He uh, he was known for playing music over the intercom day or night. Whenever the ship sailed close to shore between Lakes Huron and Erie. So he would entertain you as uh, he went past. Uh, he's known as the DJ captain, by the way. So he's one of the captains of the Edmund Fitzgerald. He also provides commentary about the ship whenever he passes the Sioux locks between Lake Superior and Huron. So if you were there watching the ship go through, he will give you like a play-by-play -play of the ship. And, and stats about the ship and all this other stuff. So I think that's pretty cool. He's kind of doing like a, a legit like living history display uh, thing about, you know, what's going on with him and the ship. Um, on November 10th, 1975, you have Captain Ernest McSorley in command. During a severe storm, McSorley is going to radio the Arthur M. Anderson, which I believe is still in operation in the lakes, saying, I have a bad list, lost both radars, and am taking heavy seas over the deck, one of the worst seas I've ever been in. And then at 710, McSorley radios, we are holding our own. And that is the last anyone hears of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Those are the last words off the ship. All 29 of her crew perish in the sinking. No bodies were recovered. They're all entombed as far as we know inside the ship the men are mostly from ohio and wisconsin they're between the ages of 20 and 63 uh, mcsorley is the eldest he's 63 uh, one of the watchmen is aged 20. the ship was located four days later in deep water by a u.s navy aircraft who was uh which was detecting magnetic anomalies on the floor of the, the lake in popular culture, obviously, we got Gordon Lightfoot uh, paying tribute to it in his 1976 song, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Uh, and he gets that idea from reading a Newsweek article from that November 1975 edition uh, about the wreck. So that in, in influences him, excuse me, to write that song. The disaster leads to changes on the Great Lakes as far as the shipping industry is concerned. Uh, you must have mandatory survival suits, depth finders, positioning systems, and greater inspections uh, on board the vessels. So Edmund Fitzgerald takes my number two position. Uh, I think I might get a vote from Shorzy on, on this one. Thank you, Shorzy, for, for that. Uh, and Dan sank on the anniversary of the Marine Corps. Was it, I did say November 10th, right? Yeah, November 10th, anniversary of the Marine Corps. There you go. There you go. Uh, Dan Lightfoot, no relation to Gordon Lightfoot. I was going to ask. <laughs> I, I, I don't think. I, I don't know. So <laughs> I'm just going to make an assumption. I hate to assume, but uh, there you go. So, yeah, Edmund Fitzgerald, my number three pick. That might be a tough one. Oh, I know eight, it will be. But, but you don't know. Do you see now that there are two of us in here? And I do. Which one should I bring in? The other guy that wants to come in. The uh, other Joe Ricci. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get we'll get split screen. Perfect. There we okay. go. All right. All right. Now all things are well. All we things are a real computer that can really do stuff. All right. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. Oh, I've got an echo. There we go. You got Better? it. Good. Yep. yep. All right. And my number two, compared to Gordon Lightfoot's Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, might be number two. Um, it might just be a number two. Who knows? Um, I went with the Star of the West. Oh. Um, figure, you know, ship that's there at the very beginning of the war. Nice. Um, she goes on the rescue mission January 61 uh, in between... Buchanan and Lincoln and goes to go and reinforce Fort Sumter, bringing new supplies, fired upon by the Citadel cadets, um, make their way back to New York and uh, takes on troops, supposed to go down to Texas and pick up um, soldiers from Indianola, 
And I also went with things that had like a local connection, or at least that I could attempt to tie to a local connection. I'm just trying to find a better spot for the computer. There we go. Um, you look lovely. It's fine. It just sits so low. <laughs> and it doesn't have a. Oh, we should have done this while I was still at work. That would have been the answer. Next time. <laughs> Sat at the office computer. That could have worked better. Yeah. Um, but. So she goes down to Indianola and she's supposed to pick up some uh, two or three regiments of men out of Texas. And she's captured by Earl Van Dorn, which, of course, living in Spring Hill, that's where Earl Van Dorn is killed in April of 1863. So I was like, oh, okay, let's let's tie that one together. A little bit of uh, interesting story there. Uh, and that's where she's captured Madam, uh, Madam Gorda Bay. Uh, and she's sent to New Orleans, and they rename her the CSS St. Philip, but nobody calls her that. Uh, everybody's still calling it the Star of the West. Uh, goes down to New Orleans, is there throughout uh, much of the winter of 1861, uh, goes into spring of 62 uh, as a hospital ship, and then uh, April 1862 along comes David Farragut, takes the city, and they send the Star of the West up the river with all the money, all the gold, everything that they can find in the city that they needed to protect. Um, and they sent the uh, Star of the West to Vicksburg. She drops off all of her cargo. And then she's brought to Yazoo City. Uh, of course, this is where her story will come to an end on the Tallahatchie River. Uh, Major General uh, uh, William Loring, who would fight at the Battle of Franklin. Uh, right. Another connection. Um, if I'm getting points for anything, it's for time <laughs> thanks to the Battle of Franklin. Um, he orders that the Star of the West be sunk sideways, broadside in the Tallahatchie River to stop gunboats from attacking Vicksburg from the rear. Uh, of course, we know that the gunboats wouldn't, couldn't have made it through the Tallahatchie at that point anyways, because it it's not navigable. Uh, so... Down goes Star of the West, and she actually sits there, essentially just disintegrating for years afterwards. I was reading an account this morning, because nothing quite like being prepared the morning of. Right. Um, do tomorrow, do tomorrow. There's some advice for you. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> and one of the things that I was reading is like 1870 or 1876 newspaper account, where they're talking about how her boiler and her steam... Uh, the the um, excuse me the paddle wheeler uh, fittings were all just sitting up out of the water line. Uh, wow! You could still just walk by and see the ship. Now, as far as I know, you can't actually see the wreck anymore. Um, mm. But with the drought, with low well, water levels, and considering that Mississippi River is giving up a bunch of its secrets, it would be kind of cool to see if uh, if we can't see the Star of the West for the first time in maybe 130, 140 years. I That's never, weird. yeah, I never knew what happened to her because we all we hear about it at Sumter, or coming to the aid yeah. of Sumter, and then all of a sudden it just vanishes. At least for us East Coasties, that's what what it is. You know, <laughs> once it once it gets beyond Florida, it's like okay, it's going off the edge of the earth. Yeah, worry about it. <laughs> I even went nautical for tonight's theme. The uh, David Farragut, nice torpedoes full of speed ahead. Nice, I like it. I like it. So we have our number two picks in, everybody. We have Joe's as the star of the West. And we have mine, the Edmund Fitzgerald. And that was my number two pick. Uh, so uh, I, I need to I need to come up with a, with a poll here. A poll question. There we go, everybody. Uh, poll is coming up right now. Which ship takes this round? I did it by ship name this time. Uh, so star of the West or the Edmund Fitzgerald. You know, back in the day when they did this on VH1, the 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 loser had to like withdraw their pick, and he come up with a thing. But I'm like, I don't like that option because sometimes people could win one round and win another round or lose another round or whatever the case may be. We're not about cutting people off here. <laughs> you know, it's not my style. So six votes are in. We got nine watching. We're close to having a hundred percent vote rate. It's great. Come on, people. We love democracy here. Let's get these votes in. <laughs> you know, I don't want to recount. I don't want eight votes and it's 50 50. All right. We got it. We got it. All or not. The fourth one in the pocket, just in case. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. 
it's like, are we going to have to go to overtime? We're gonna, it's going to be Joe and I Googling. <laughs> like, what's really going? cool, fascinating shipwrecks. <laughs> yes. Yeah, seven votes are in. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Mike called it seven. I don't know. Oh, eight votes. Joe's coming back. I don't think so. I don't think there's a way 62 to 6238 right now. It is 6238. <clears throat> but yeah, this is good. Uh, I have a list of future top threes as well. I don't know if I'm going to do one next week because I'm leaving for uh, Canada for Remembrance Day. But uh, we'll have Ty back on again. We hope Ty gets better soon. Uh, poor guy. Not the... Seems like all my friends are under the weather one way or another from time to time now. We're all getting it. I don't know what it is. Eight votes are in. Edmund Fitzgerald has 62%. Thank you for your votes, everybody. Thank you for voting early and voting often. We really appreciate that. All right. So we are down to our number one picks. Joe, I'm going to let you go first this round because you're my first. guest and I'm not ready <laughs> because I want to put in some stuff here for like to bring up on banners. So go ahead and do your number one. Or were you just Googling your number one? No, no, I'm not Googling. <laughs> That'd be over here if I was doing that. Just, um, don't, just don't give me a shit that I can't spell. That's all. <laughs> okay. I I am going to give this choice as a story okay because it has a twist and i always love a good twist to the story All right so prohibition begins january 16th 1920 and the united states coast guard becomes the enforcement agency for the department of treasury uh they're essentially anti-smugglers uh anti-smuggler patrols and what they do is they beef up all of the cutters on the gulf of mexico uh, reinforce like the Pascagoula station to starts to get in more cutters, old Navy ships, um, flush, uh, uh, deck, flush deck, uh, cutters, uh, and destroyers, two of which the Walcott and the Dexter, uh, one of the most infamous rum runners though, in the Gulf is the I'm alone. Uh, she's a Canadian built, uh, uh, rum runner, schooner, sailboat. She runs under a British flag, under the Union Jack. And her captain is the infamous Jack Randell. Uh, this whole incident becomes just this absolute international crisis. So it's late November of 1928. And the Dexter spots, uh, excuse me, the Dexter and the Walcott both spot. Uh, I'm alone near Trinity Shoals in Louisiana. Uh, but Randell, using the darkness, using a couple of uh, uh, routes through the swamp that he knows, manages to escape. And Alfred Powell, the uh, commander of the Dexter, is reported to have said, I'll make you a bet. The next time we meet up with that old SOB, I'll get him. He doesn't have to wait very long. March 20th, 1929, the, the I'm Alone is spotted by Walcott. Uh, he's coming up out of South America, pops into the Gulf, and he's essentially doing this kind of shoot up out of what we would call the Yucatan over towards Louisiana, drop off things with mosquito ships, and then shoot back down into the Gulf, get out of the 12-mile limit. He's spotted by Walcott with uh, $62,000 worth of cargo. He's ordered to heave, to heave two, and Randell replied, you can shoot me or sink me, but damned if you'll board me. Walcott's instructed to use all force. So Frank Paul, the commander of the Walcott, goes over and actually is able to talk to Randell. Uh, they have a, a discussion. And then hours later, he's told, use all force to apprehend them. So he stays behind them, just kind of drifts behind them. Uh, then on the 21st, she's evaded them. Mm -hmm. But the pursuit continues, which you're not supposed to do. Unless you could argue that the Walcott never stopped the pursuit and the Dexter just comes along to help. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Twist. So, so uh, Alfred Powell, 
who had said he would get him one day, mm -hmm. tells Randell, he too would be fired upon. And at 8.15, Dexter just absolutely blasts away at the I'm Alone and sunk by 9.03 a.m., 220 miles south of Louisiana. The uh, survivors are hauled on board. There's one fatality. Uh, but this causes an, a massive international incident because you've got the U.S. Coast Guard firing on a Canadian-built ship flying in a, a British Union Jack. Yep. So you've got this kind of crisis between the State Department and the foreign ministers of, of both countries. And then uh, add into this, all of this is so important. The sinking of the I'm Alone inspires another pop culture uh, folk song, Wade Hemsworth's, uh, the, the Canadian poet and uh, uh, folk singer, writes a song and he calls Randell the good Samaritan to thirsty Americans. Um, but here's the twist. I'm not even going to say that the I'm alone is my favorite shipwreck. It's mm. the Dexter because it's Oh, painful. so I got it wrong. The Dexter was decommissioned in 1936. And the ultimate irony is that she ends her life as a wet bar dinner cruiser with one 800 party boat a fixed oh, my and today she rests as a reef at the bottom of Lake Michigan. So the Dexter is your number one choice. The Dexter is my number one choice. Wow, I had the wrong one up. Okay, I like it. What a twist! What a plot twist! You gotta do it every now and then. Wow, wow, yeah, you you might win best story for the night there. That's that's really good. Yeah, Shorzy, yeah, that's a heck of a story. Yeah, that's awesome. I have to give credit to where I got that from. That was my dad's master's thesis. So <laughs> nice. <laughs> got to use what you know, man. Oh yeah, yeah. Keep it in the family. That's fine. <laughs> that's fine. That's that's really cool. That's really cool. That's a good. That's a good one. I don't know if I can top that. That is one. I don't know if I can top. I might lose this round. I might lose it. Sir, you have won the game. <laughs> I don't know about this. Uh, <laughs> that's that's quite impressive. All right, so now I got to come up with mine. Again, thank you all for being here this evening and hearing us. Uh, we wish there were three, <laughs> but yeah. Ty is Ty is under the weather. He'll, we'll bring him back when we do like top three grunge bands or something. We'll, we'll do that, and then we'll just wear flannel all night so uh if you're not already subscribed please subscribe below after hearing that little thing and uh slap that bell when you know we're live my number one this is why i don't get to sit on panels because my brain is like a squirrel i'm just all <laughs> over the place uh my number one pick was a ship that obviously what that was at pearl harbor and um, it's not the obvious because I'm not obvious. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't rock the boat that much. My pick, USS Nevada, Ooh. the ship that would not die, is my pick for the number one shipwreck. Everyone's gonna be upset because I didn't pick the Arizona. But hear me out about this. I'm not saying I don't want to go to the Arizona and see it. I'm, we're not like picking like that kind of thing. This isn't like where we want to visit. This one though, this is an amazing ship. Okay. Uh, she is the lead amongst the Nevada class battleships. She's got a whole class named after her. Her sister ship was also on battlefield, uh, battlefield on a uh, battleship row that morning. The Oklahoma, they are sister ships. She's launched July 11th, 1914. She has the all or nothing principle of armor, which I'm sure irritated some of the guys on board ship because you either have all the armor or you have nothing on there. So this is basically like when you see that diagram of the aircraft that come back all shot up from anti-aircraft fire and they're like, well, they survived this with this much damage here. So that's not what we're going to reinforce. We're going to reinforce the other areas. 
they think the same way in 1914 about ships. They're like, well, we know the key parts of the ship. Let's just armor her there. And the rest of it can be thinly armored, if armored at all. It doesn't need to be armored there. We can just let shells pass through one side and the other. It's 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 fine. It's not going to blow up the boilers or or you know anything like that. So it has the all or nothing principle of armor. She's not engaged in the First World War, although she does go overseas during the war. Uh, she is also one of ten battleships and twenty eight destroyers who escort President Wilson to the Paris Peace Conference to Europe uh, to the Paris Peace Conference. December 7th, 1941, she is moored next to Ford Island, a right smack dab in the center of Pearl Harbor. Uh, so when you see Battleship Row, that island that they are tied up against is Ford Island. So she is there. Luckily, she does not have a ship on her side. She is moored by herself against the island just to the rear of Arizona. So she is right behind Arizona. And we all know what happens to Arizona. A torpedo slams into, into the side of the ship during the first attack, the first wave. There are two massive waves, and, and uh, Nevada gets hit with a torpedo. But it does not paralyze the ship because of this all armor or no armor principle, all or nothing. She is heavily armored in the torpedo line of the ship. So it causes some damage, obviously, but it doesn't fatally hurt the ship. And in the meantime, they're trying to get it underway and get it moving. This will be the only battleship that gets moving during the attack on Pearl Harbor. She actually breaks free of battleship row and starts heading towards the channel to try to get to open water. The second wave of Japanese attacks comes through and they drop multiple bombs onto Nevada and she catches on fire. And she's also taking on water, and they decide, well, the best thing we can do is just ground her because they're worried if she sinks in the middle of the channel, it could make the channel impassable. And now we have a bigger problem. So they just decide to turn and head for land and let it smack in the land and let her sit. Um, the ship suffers six bomb hits and that initial torpedo strike at least. 60 killed, 109 wounded. So because she's not sunk, uh, it's pretty easy as far as repairs are concerned compared to some other ones like Oklahoma and, and some others. Uh, Nevada takes part in the repulse of the Japanese invasion of the Aleutian Islands at Attu. She fires shells into the German defenses on, at the Cherbourg Peninsula during the invasion of Normandy. She's the only battleship at Normandy who was at Pearl Harbor. Uh, every, some people say the Texas. The Texas was in Maine when, when uh, Pearl Harbor was attacked. So no, that's not it. Uh, Operation Dragoon in southern France. She is there in the late summer of 1944. Then to Iwo Jima. Then to Okinawa. And then to Tokyo Bay. Uh, she survives the war, obviously. She's in Tokyo Bay for a while, and they start to inspect the ships of the fleet. And they're like, well, this ship is over 32 years old. She's she's old. Refitting isn't going to do anything. We might as well get rid of the Nevada and the Nevada class overall. So they decide, well, we're going to use her for testing purposes, and we're going to test her uh, capabilities against atomic weaponry. So they transport her uh, further out into the Pacific, and her next operation is Operation Crossroads. July 1946, the atomic testing at Bikini Atoll. And we have thousands and thousands of photos of this. Uh, the, the U.S. Navy and the Defense Department or War Department at that time, they set up cameras everywhere. We have cameras that are shooting a 1,000 shots a second out there. So this thing is the most heavily documented thing we've ever done so far. Nevada is, is to be the target vessel of an aerial atomic bomb drop. She is painted orange so that the uh, bombardier can see her 
on on board uh, or amongst this fleet. So there's a whole fleet. There's like aircraft carriers and cruisers, and they're just going to take them all out and figure out what happens when you get hit with an atomic weapon. So they want this guy to be able to find the Nevada. So they paint her orange. Uh, so there's your bullseye point. The bombardier misses <laughs> the, the Nevada. So luckily he wasn't over Hiroshima or Nagasaki. He might have missed the drop point. Uh, this is the first test code named Abel. He misses by 1,700 yards. It's not like it's a near miss. This guy missed by over a mile. Okay, you know, 1,700 yards is a lot. It it detonates over a different ship in, in the fleet altogether. Nevada does not sink. So the atomic bomb, the airborne atomic bomb, uh, dropped 1,700 yards away, and she did not sink. She would not do anything. She's just sitting there. Uh, the final test is a few weeks later. It's codenamed Baker. The atomic detonation is 90 feet under the ocean surface. So they take the bomb and they put it 90 feet under the surface of the ocean and they're going to blast it from there. Okay. So <laughs> Nevada takes the hit and remains afloat from that as well. But the spray from the, the, uh, the atomic blast is radioactive. And so it's covered in radioactive ocean spray. All right. So she's towed back to Pearl Harbor. She's survived all this stuff. She goes back to Pearl Harbor. She's officially decommissioned in 1946, August of 1946. This happens in July. She's decommissioned the next month. So how do you get rid of the ship that won't die? Well, the Navy decides they're going to use her for gunnery practice. Yeah. So they tow her back out to sea. And the USS Iowa and a couple other ships are brought in to blast this thing out of, you know, off the face of the earth and make this thing sink. They don't sink her. <laughs> so, <laughs> ship on ship is not working in this way. So they finally call in a torpedo run on the ship. The, the very thing that didn't sink her in 1941, they call in a torpedo run. One torpedo hits dead center amidships and all, basically breaks her keel. And she finally sinks to the bottom of the ocean. She's discovered again in May of 2020. Uh, she is 65 nautical miles southwest of Pearl, laying on the ocean floor 15,400 feet down. That's a long, long way when you consider Titanic is two miles. This is over almost three. This is almost three miles, right? 15,000, somewhere around there. 15,400 feet. She's capsized. Uh, the bow and stern are torn from the wreck because the keel was broken. Uh, within a debris field, you can find parts of the deck, the superstructure, and plot twist, an M26 Pershing tank. Because in the original atomic test, they put a tank on her deck to see what would happen. I don't know why, but there it is. There's a so if you're into world of warships and you're also into world of tanks, you're gonna love the USS Nevada. So there you go. That's my my number one pick. Gotta go. Gotta go with the Nevada. I I love Shorzy's comment. Shorzy, you take you take comment of the night. I didn't hear no bell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, that's why she's the ship who won't die. So. <clears throat> Kojak, why do you have to be so technical? It's not classified as a shipwreck. It's a ship. She is wrecked, and she is on the bottom of the ocean. She counts for tonight. The Sultana, someone brought up. I, is that considered a shipwreck? It's on land. Uh, the Vasa. <laughs> We're not going to get too technical tonight. So there you go. USS Nevada. So that's tough. That's gonna be tough to have to. I mean, I'm alone. My, my, the Dexter could hold up, but I know this is a tough vote because your story, I think, is better. I don't know. I mean, I don't want to sit here and advocate for <laughs> the other guy, but no, uh, what I'm saying is 
I never heard that story. And a it's, lot of people don't know that story. And some people have heard of the ship that don't, that won't die. So I'm thinking from the story perspective, I think yours should take it, but we'll see. We'll let, we'll let the community vote, but yeah, this is, this is good. This is a good one. And we're coming in right at, right at 50 minutes. So we, we did a lot of talking tonight. Oh yeah. What's, yeah. What's new? You know, what, uh, what is going on on the podcast front, my friend? You're, you're doing this podcast for, for Franklin. Yeah. So uh, one of the things I took over in the last year was uh, the Dispatch, the official podcast of the Battle of Franklin Trust. So mm -hmm. we release monthly, but right now quarterly, just because it's been so heckin' busy. Uh, yeah. Uh, quarterly episodes, uh, monthly episodes that sometimes pertain to the story that we tell every single day other times are just um civil war topics that i said hey you know we don't get to talk about this a lot and i really like it or i enjoy it so let's bring it in um mm -hmm. people from our staff eventually going to try and branch out bring in some people from outside of the outside of the umbrella out into the the public history world and get people's perspectives on uh the events that unfolded in Franklin, November of 1864. Uh, it's so crucial to our story, but then it's just, it's part of such a much larger story too. So yeah, that's, uh, that consumes a lot of time uh, yeah. <laughs> energy and efforts, but if you're not subscribed, go on, it's on uh, Apple, it's on Spotify, it's on all of them, uh, anywhere that you find your podcast. Awesome. And I was just going to ask that. Where can people find the, the podcast? Just about everywhere. I mean, I, I think I have got a feed out for every platform. So good. Uh, most common um, listenership that comes from Apple, I, I still think that's going to always mm -hmm. hold the hold the, as long as people are walking around with iPhones. That's going to hold the reins. Yeah, when I was still doing the podcast regularly, my largest audience was Apple as well. So yeah, a lot of nerds have Apple. Apparently, <laughs> it works for us. Hey, I'm I'm hey. fine. Hey, you know, uh, we are tied after eight votes on the final one. So what we're going to do is we are going to do a poll. The final poll will ask which list do you like the best? Because we did this last week. Uh, which list do you like the best? Uh, whose list wins tonight? And that's be our final poll question for the night. Uh, but thank you all for being here. Really appreciate you. I'll leave the list going across the bottom there until you are done. I don't think you can uh, vote for both. We got uh, <laughs> we got we got to vote for both. <laughs> it's, very, it's very democratic of you, Kojak. Thank you. Where you go, Kojak? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, but yeah, that, that, I think you have better stories than I did because I didn't know what happened to the star of the West and I've never heard of the Dexter. So I I'd vote for my competition. I gotta tell you, my dad just texted me and he said, thank you so much for giving me credit for your success. Nice. <laughs> nice. There you go. He'll is just, he, is he in, is he in, in the chat? If he is, and he's he not voting, I'll be I know. I'm waiting <laughs> because right now I got votes up and there's none for you. And I'm like, dad you better vote for your son <laughs> be a dad oh you got it. there you go there it is it <laughs> worked. peer pressure with voting works don't don't tell the government i said that um yeah it's it's uh it's good to do this kind of stuff because i i talked to some people about us doing lists like this and i said you know it's always good to have historians on to to actually just talk and showcase who they are as people instead of just us bloviating about a historical thing we're working on. <laughs> I think sometimes we get we get we get lost in that where we're like I got to showcase what I do, yeah. But at the same time, you don't showcase who you are, and I think some stuff like this can help. I mean, yeah, maybe that's my opinion, but I always like the idea of listing this kind of stuff out and just having fun with it. Yeah, this was so. super fun. I mean, I have uh, I've greatly enjoyed this. I'm glad, my friend. I'm glad that the, the tech worked out. <laughs> just took paper. a little while. Just took a little, hey, you know. Took a while, a factory reset of my MacBook, you know, whatever. It's all good. Yeah, it's it's fine. It's fine. 
uh, everyone, uh, please, again, go vote on uh, the, our last poll of this evening. Uh, whose list wins tonight? Again, the list is scrolling across the bottom here. Uh, we got Joe with uh, the Alexander Hamilton, the Star of the West, and the Dexter. And I have the Vasa, the Edmund Fitzgerald, and the Nevada as my top three. Um, surprises tonight. One, neither of us picked the Arizona. Uh, two, the Monitor was not said tonight. I thought about it. I thought about it, too. I was wondering if the if the if that one would come up or not. Yeah, but I thought it, monitor. I I also thought um, of the uh, the Cairo. The Cairo, yeah. I thought about it, but yeah, you know, mm. yeah. I I don't know. I wanted to spread it out over different time periods too. That was my yeah. thing. But, yeah, that was my thought. Was kind of. I mean, now granted, all of mine were nineteenth and twentieth century, but. I, I I thought about I thought about the hood and the Bismarck. Yeah, those would have been fun. But I looked at it, I was like, no, easy, easy. John or Ty is going to have that. Yeah. Uh, Kojak says the Mary Rose. I actually thought about the Mary Rose. I also thought about the uh, Prince Eugen. You brought up the hood. Yeah. Uh, Prince Eugen is one that we took out there and did the atomic testing on with Nevada. And uh, I'm like, maybe we'll, maybe I should do that one. And then I'm like, no, Nevada has a better, to me, Nevada had a better story. But did we just totally miss the the completely overrated shipwreck of all? Titanic. Yeah, the Mammoth. Oh, yeah. We didn't even talk about it. And that's that's too obvious. Yeah, fair. <laughs> fair. You know what I mean? It's like, come on, really? I mean, would anybody watch if it's like, well, number one's Titanic? Really? Yeah, that was you know, easy. You gotta. Uh, here in Shorzy, I I wanted I thought about this one, Lusitania. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was a close one for me. I thought about the Lusitania instead of the Vasa. Um, that one is really important. Just don't look up too much stuff about the Lusitania online because I got into a wormhole with that kind of thing. And I'm like, I wonder what people talk about when they talk about the Lusitania. And obviously it's like the Lusitania, the reason America got involved in World War One. And I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> wasn't that way at all even that could not get us involved yes i did think about that one any any other ones that were like obvious that we didn't let us know chad if there's any that were obvious that we might Somebody earlier said the indianapolis yeah the indy i thought about that one too instead of the nevada yeah I, thank I, you all for voting as well uh 60 40 i somehow pulled out a victory Congrats to you. I mean, but I thought all of your stories were really cool. I thought your ships were cooler. Um, I don't know about that. Mine had mine had cool stories that I had to dig for. <laughs> you have cool stories that are just the Nevada is just it's one of those things where it, it just continues to get the hell beat out of it. <laughs> it feels it, it's like what it's like what I feel like in the pandemic. <laughs> just continues to get the hell beat out of it, and I'm still here. You know, I had I had COVID uh, in the early part. No one knew what the hell it was. I just kept going. Yeah. <laughs> Dan, thank you for that. Both had excellent list. Again, two weeks in a row since we've done this, uh, we have not had overlaps. Yeah. Not not both weeks. Last week you had nine films set in the 1700s, which surprised me that we didn't have an overlap. But then with this, I think it was good to have Joe on because he and I think are like, well, we're not going to do the obvious. <laughs> you know, I hate to say that because Ty was really into the Titanic. And I'm like, I bet, I bet he's got Titanic on his list. <laughs> I think if you like, if you really love the Titanic, you have to include it. It's not, yeah. it's not a thing where you think you're going to win with it. You just have to do it because it's, it's obligatory. You, you, you have no choice. Yeah. Yeah. I will definitely have him back on here. Maybe we'll do like top three natural disasters or something. <laughs> and have somehow him. that'll be the Titanic too. You so, can well, that's a man made. Well, is it man made or is it national? It's man made, isn't it? I mean, it's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of both. Yeah. It kind of crosses both lines. I'm willing to give him the point before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. 
Swarzy, thank you for being here. Have fun booping tanks on your Twitch stream. Get plenty of views, my friend. Uh, yeah, I, now now the fun part would be, I wonder what Ty would have chosen. Because he didn't say anything. We, we, don't, we don't tell each other. We just show up. I did tell you my number one pick uh, when I sent you that video. Oh, my God. <laughs> yes, the wave video. What was that? Was that Yamato? That's what it was supposed to be. Yeah. 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 That I've seen that before and it's hilarious. Hilarious. But yes, Joe, thank you so much for being on tonight Absolutely. and for overcoming the tech problems. I was worried about you. And I'm like, I hope he's not like slamming like a laptop against the wall. But it was. <laughs> <laughs> the Englishman has shown. Uh, Darren, Darren, uh, yeah, I figured, yeah, Darren. Uh, did you did you hang that picture of George Washington in your bathroom yet, Darren? Um, remember the Lincoln joke? Remember I the did. Lincoln joke? It's the only thing that hangs in our guest room. Is the guest bathroom? You got a picture of Washington in it. That's right. That's right. Thank you, with me, giant nerd. Yes. Uh, don't forget Darren as well. Uh, the Carpathia, the history of the Carpathia. She's a shipwreck now, thanks to the Germans. Um, she was sunk in the Second World War, I believe, by a German U-boat. So the, the ship who came to rescue as many as they could from Titanic, Carpathia. Uh, she was sunk in, I believe, it was the Second World War. Let, let me know if I'm wrong, Darren, uh, by U-boat. And then... Uh, Charles Light, here we go. Charles Lightoller, who was one of the officers on Titanic, is also the one who was at Dunkirk that they used in the movie. Uh, the old guy in the movie is supposed to be Charles Lightoller from the Titanic. Hmm. So, I there's your bit of Titanic for tonight. That's so, I did not know that. Yeah. Lightoller is one of the guys who survives t Titanic, and then he takes his personal craft to Dunkirk to get guys back to England hmm. when they're called upon. So, British hero. British hero. That's really cool. So, yeah, if you ever need ice in your drinks, ask Charles Lightoller where the nearest ice is. He'll find it. <laughs> so, I'm full of dad jokes. Everybody, thank you so much for voting this evening. Uh, don't forget to vote next Tuesday if you haven't already done so. Uh, I don't want to know how. Just just go vote. Um, my mail-in is done. I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> standing in a line anymore so uh but please go do your civic duty as you've done your duty here with your with your poll questions i really appreciate that joe thank you again for the wonderful list and a great time my friend absolutely hope you all have a fantastic evening be safe be well wish well for ty uh let's get him back up and running so we can get him on a top three uh i don't know what we'll do but we'll get him on here for that and please everybody have a great evening <laughs>